on social issues. My name is Kimberly Tate Malone, and I'm one of the reference and instructional librarians here. I recognize a lot of faces. Um, for those who have not been to COSI before, I want to let you know why we hold this series in the library. This series has been happening for about six and a half years now, and we're proud to host it because we see it as a way for us to all learn from each other's expertise and experiences so that we can learn and grow from those who have different perspectives and viewpoints. So whether or not you agree with every single thing that you hear in this session or read any of the books that are available up here or find on our shelf, we want everyone to have wide access to a range of perspectives so that we can learn. So I ask that we give our respectful attention to our panelists. At the end of this, I'll ask you to fill out a brief survey asking what you like, how we can continue to improve, and what topics you'd be interested in seeing in the future. I do plan this quarterly, and so while the spring quarter schedule is kind of filled up, um, I'm already thinking ahead to fall. If you are interested in leading a session, go ahead and contact me uh, during af after the session or via email. You can find me outside. Um, and we can see if we can get you on the panel, right? Or to lead a session. So without further ado, I want you to join us in welcoming the folks for our last COSI of this quarter. So Allison will be introducing everyone, but I'll be introducing Allison, who <laughs> Allison McCormick is going to be facilitating this panel, and she is the person who put together this fantastic group of people. So please join me in welcoming Allison and the rest of our panel. So thank you so much um, for coming. We really, really appreciate this opportunity. And I think we have just before today a uh, representation of real powerhouse of individuals here that you will be hearing from. And I want to just take a minute. I'm Allison McCormick. I am the director of two programs here at Seattle Central. One is an employment program for people with disabilities, and the other is a support program, an academic support program for people who um, are on the spectrum and are attending classes here at Seattle Central. Also, I am the executive, um, on the executive board for our pro staff union, Local 6550 AFT, um, and we just recently successfully, tentatively signed off on our second contract, so we're very happy with that. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and say a few words about them, and then we have uh, a few questions that will just start our um, discussion today with and hopefully generate some conversation. I'm going to start by introducing Dart Fry. And here's the end. She's a labor educator with the Washington Federation of State Employees Council 28. And uh, the WFSE is the Union for All State Employees and Public Service Workers. Um, and serve, they represent over 40,000 uh, employees in Washington State. Next, I have Tommy Fulstrad. Full uh, probably messed up that last name. Sorry if I did it. But he is an activist and, uh, and a member of the Washington Federation of State Employees, uh, local 304 here um, at Four Seattle Colleges. He is employed as a landscaper at North Seattle Community College and is also on the STARS Committee there. And then next, um, I have Myra Kutzar. Okay. <laughs> She's an organizer for SEIU 1199 Service Employees International. They represent more than 29,000 um, nurses and health care workers across Washington State. Um, and then we have Karen Strickland, who's the Washington State President of AFT. Um, and AFT is, well, like I said, that's our professional staff uh, union as well. And AFT represents over 6,500 education employees in 32 community and technical colleges, universities, Head Start, and K-12 schools. And then, um, lastly, we have <coughs> Dawn Dreyhardt, and she's an organizer with the Teamsters 117. She's um, a, uh, has been recognized a lot um, in the community. She was um, nominated for, or received an award Women in leadership. Um, she's been actively um, assisting Uber drivers, I guess, re most recently, organizing tech drivers, now Uber drivers, um, creating, making it so that um, Uber drivers are actually good jobs for 
for people. And that's been interesting with her background in the digital world, so to speak. So I have some questions that I want to just pose to the panel and to maybe go take a minute or two uh, and respond to them. The first one being down the line this way. So the first one being um, uh, the millennials being economically and politically adrift is a myth. And in fact, they're stepping in readily to um, fill union ranks, which have endured decades of attempts to dismantle the rights of workers in this country. A labor movement that we have been led to believe as getting older and smaller is actually growing younger and stronger. Uh, why do you think unions are important to this generation um, as in the workforce? <coughs> Allison, um, I will start by responding to the, the myths you identified. I think that one thing that unions and young workers have in common is that there are some strong stereotypes out there about us um, that aren't always based on our lived experiences. And so um, the idea that young workers aren't political not true. Um, young workers are organizing some of the most relevant movements right now that intersect with labor. Um, and this idea that you know unions are dying is something I heard a lot growing up that has not been my lived experience either. Um, in fact, we've been recently seeing that in 2017, young workers are make up of the majority of newly unionized workers. And that's really exciting to me, um, and I think to a lot of people in this room, I hope. Um, but as far as why unions are important, unions have always been how we make change at work. Um, at its heart, a union being just a group of workers who come together to make change, to make a difference in their workplace or in their communities. Um, today, we have all these legal categories and these sort of legal frameworks that we associate with unions as well. Um, a lot of hard-won rights that we have, but a union is simply a group of workers who come together to make change. Um, and then it's hard, you know, what we know is that young workers are facing insecurity or facing um, questions around the ability to have benefits in retirement, um, to know what your schedule is going to be week to week. Um, disrespect, discrimination, many challenges in the workplace, and Unions basically are ha one of the, I think, most relevant ways we can address those issues, either change them through laws or change them through taking action on the shop floor, on the job, to say this treatment isn't okay um, and we propose a change. Hi, my name is Tommy. From so for the liberal movement, um, it, it's really worth it for us that we make it really important for us that, that we get equality for everybody at the workplace. Because in some workplaces, they're not really treated very fairly. It's totally disproportional and they're unequal. And, and it can be really problematic for each other and really stressful. And also, and we also want to stand against discrimination that happens. It's, it's not right, it's not appropriate. <coughs> so it's not fair to discriminate against anybody for race, religion, or any of that. So I've joined my union and that's one of the reasons why I joined, to work on the equality for everybody. Yeah, um, so for me, um, I never really grew <coughs> up um, in a union household. My parents were actually immigrants to this country. Um, so they came into this country as farm workers. Um, I was the oldest of three, and I saw um, that mistreatment, right, of my parents um, at work every day. Uh, a lot of times, sometimes they wouldn't get their breaks, they'd come home tired. Um, child care wasn't always available for them. Um, so, you know, for me, growing up, I was always questioning everything. Um, my, my parents as immigrants, my mom would always, you know, push back a little bit when I would question things, right? Like about why 
you know, why it was okay for people to treat them like that and their coworkers like that. I didn't understand. Um, and it wasn't until I got much older, I, I'm a first generation college student, right? And I um, attended school at Western Washington University. I started student organizing there and that's when I was first introduced to unions. And so that was when, you know, the first time for me where I was able to put my feelings, um, you know, in, into, in, into words, right? I wasn't able, like, I, I, wasn't, I didn't know what unions were, but I knew that I wanted people to have equality, right, in the workforce. So I didn't want them to be judged by the color of their skin or their, their immigration status, right? Um, so those things were really important to me. So once I was introduced to unions, um, you know, I got um, into these spaces and, and would come home and talk to my parents about that work, right, about the importance of unions and the importance of why this, you know, this work is, <coughs> right, to making sure that you're able to get those breaks that you didn't get when I was a kid and didn't understand why. Um, you know, why they were treated the way they were, right, because they were immigrants and a lot of times they accepted the treatment at work because they didn't, you know, feel like they had an option, right, out of fear. Um, they had to provide for their family and, you know, at the end of the day, they come home exhausted, sometimes they didn't take their breaks. Um, and I feel like now I do this work and I remember, you know, the work that my parents had to go through and there's so many people like them. Um, so that's why to me, um, you know, young people definitely do take a huge role, right, in this work, no matter where you come from or who your parents are. Um, that doesn't mean we're not actively involved in unions or see the importance of it. I completely agree with what was, what was said before, right? We're, we're taking the lead in, you know, some of the most relevant movements, right? That um, are definitely, um, you know, overlapping. I started in student organizing and was like, hey, students are workers too, right? <laughs> um, and so a lot of us are working, right? And so not only are we working, you know, all these ridiculous hours, right, to pay rent, which there's no rent control, rent keeps going up, um, but we're also going to school, we're studying, we're, we're attempting to have a social life and trying to get eight hours of sleep every day. Um, so that's why, right, um, to sum it up, you know, unions, I think for this generation, it's really important That's you know, and, and young people are getting involved, so I think it's definitely a myth that we're not. Thank you. Um, so, I'm Karen Strickland, and I actually used to teach here, uh, taught here for 20 years, and then I went on to uh, become the president of the state federation. Um, and so I used to teach a lot of things that connected with, uh, with this subject. And I think one thing I would say is that um, the labor movement is a social justice movement. I would say that historically it's had its limitations in terms of how it defined social justice and it wasn't all inclusive. But the labor movement, which is about the rights of people working, um, people, the right to come together and have your voice heard as a collective, um, the right to safe working conditions, to breaks, to all of these things, those are all social justice issues. And so with labor, the labor movement being a social justice movement, then, um, and I, I kind of cringe a little bit when I hear terms used to describe different generations, whether it's millennials or Generation X or the boomers or whatever, because I just think there's change, right? Every generation is different than the one before and after, and that just continues. Um, but I mean, I think it's fair to say that the younger generations have largely been the drivers of social justice movements, and it's because of young people that so many, so much progress has happened. So I think it's really essential that um, that we in in the social justice movement, whether it's in organized labor or it's in uh, environmental um, climate justice or in housing, you know, whatever that issue is, I think we have to um, break down the barriers between the categories and all come together in the name of social justice for everybody. So I, I think that in, in, you know, I think having a, a union does mean that at the job you have a way to bargain for particular rights and that's really important. So I don't think, I'm not saying that that can go away as we break down the barriers. But what I'm saying is there's a structure that helps us get the best working conditions we can while we're working, but that structure needs to connect with all the other um, social justice movements because at the end of the day, and whether a person is in a union formally or not, at the end of the day, what we all want is a safe place to live, a good quality of life, time to have our breaks and go on vacation too. <laughs> there are many things that everybody wants. These are not, we all want these things and that's what the labor movement is about. And I think it's great, um, I like hearing uh, um, 
you know, statistics about the increase and the, the majority group that's growing within the labor movement is um, young people. I think that those numbers are really important. Um, and in addition, the, the number of young people that uh, have the same values and principles as the labor movement is enormous. So whether somebody identifies with labor or not, uh, we share a lot of the same values and want to have the same aspirations for our quality of life in our families and communities. And I just wanted to make one one observation, though, about how um, I think younger people have a different experience than people in my generation, for example. Um, and so my mom was in a union, although I didn't really have any union consciousness while I was growing up. I don't remember ever talking about it, but I do remember going to union picnics. And she worked at Western State Hospital, so that's where they had the picnics. And I remember that very clearly, like all the union workers coming together. But we never really talked about it, so I didn't have much of a consciousness about the union until I was asked to get involved when I was a member here. And it all lined up with my values and the social justice stuff that I was interested in. So I increasingly got involved, and then as my mother aged, then I really saw clearly the benefits of the union in my, how I benefited, because two really quick examples, she was a WFSI member, and uh, as a woman working in the 60s and 70s, she was underpaid relative to the male counterparts, and so WFSI filed a lawsuit to get comparable worth, and it didn't happen until all of us kids moved out, which was unfortunate, but nonetheless, she did get an enormous raise after that lawsuit, um, they came to a settlement. And then that translated to a pension. So as a state worker, she had a, a pension, and it had been, um, it was more because of this comparable worth study. So as she aged, and I was one of the caretakers, my life was directly um, impacted in a good way by those union uh, experiences and benefits that she had. So, you know, again, I, I think younger people today don't, aren't as likely to have benefited from the benefits their parents accrued as union members because union membership has declined and working conditions have declined. Yeah, um, I had a different, it's been, it's interesting to hear all the different experiences um, just here from the panel and I'm excited to hear questions from you all just to see what your experiences are. I was glad to hear that um, there was even going to be a panel about this and I'm glad to see that there's people here. Um, I, when I was, you know, I have eight siblings so the fact that my father was in a union made a big difference for our family because there's like, you know, like just one too many kids maybe um, if you're trying to uh, support people and so having a union actually made a difference and if you work for Union US talk about what's the union difference um, but you know and we can point to differences in wages and treatment at work and the level of um, pain disparity between genders all those things are different when you have a union but for me the union difference was that there was some job security um, a big difference for me is when I got out of college um, I actually just went and studied industrial labor relations which is not a thing that a lot of people do when they get out of high school, but that was what I got my degree in. But when I got out of college, it was like right after the uh, economic recession, and so it was a really bad time to try to find work, and people's relationships to work um, had really changed. Like my parents met working at the post office when they were like 15 and 16, and my dad just retired, he's 62. So he just had the same job his entire life, where that doesn't happen anymore. When I got out of school, there weren't any jobs. And um, a lot of people were not sure what would change after there was a recession. And my job at the time, I went to work for the International Labor Organization, which is like the UN's labor arm. And I, my job was to write about predictions for North America and what we thought would happen after the economic crisis. And what we determined was that there would be a long period of time where um, there would be wage stagnation, just as there has been since the 70s, but also that huge portions of the economy would be moved to the informal sector, meaning people who used to have a regular job, whether it was a low-wage job at a fast food place or whether it was a job being a teacher, a regular, a regular union job even, um, those people would be moved into the informal economy, meaning they're going to have to start piecing together a living. We didn't know about jobs that happened over applications at that time, but we knew that people would have to find a new way to find a job because you were no longer going to have an employer for the rest of your life, and that's a, a global trend. Um, and that really materialized and I think gave way to the rise of what you know we call the gig economy now, which is the work that I focus on. So like I'm the Uber driver's union rep and the Lyft driver's union rep, but those that's not their only job. They do Amazon Flex and they do um, 
Grubhub and they do Uber Eats and they drive for Uber and they drive for Lyft and they have a normal part-time job where they're an employee at a place and then they also you know, have three or four other gigs that they put together. And um, had it not been for there being an economic collapse, there wouldn't have been a huge workforce of people who no longer have traditional employment and we're now going to be looking for work. So that made it like really ripe for companies like platforms to, to come in and say, hey, Postmates guy, you don't really have a job, you just need to fill your spare time and make some extra money. Um, there's a huge workforce of people that could be brought on to become what are called 1099 employees. And 1099 is um, your tax form that you get when you're not really an employee, when you're an independent contractor. And I think that as more and more employers realize that all the protections that we fought for over the years, all of the rights that we have as union workers, none of those things um, apply to people who aren't employees. So you can't file an anti-discrimination claim if you don't have an employer because they didn't discriminate against you for, for hiring. And you're not protected by OSHA or other health and safety rules. Like there's very little protection that exists for independent contractors. And that means there's very little risk for would-be employers if they can say, oh, you know what, instead of owning a bunch of cars and then insuring them and having you drive them and taking that responsibility, you're just going to drive your own car. I'll give you an app, and it's not my responsibility if you get in an accident, get towed, lose your job, have a problem with a customer. Um, and so I think what we can expect is that more employers will realize that they can externalize risk onto workers by not having employees. Um, and so I think unions need to be able to be there to be uh, not just a, a backbone for traditional employees, but also start to be a place where not employees can go to have rights and a say at work. Because whatever your tax classification is, you still are a human being doing a job and that means that you should have a say in what happens. So I think unions are going to have to change the way that um, they've been doing things as work, as the way the way we work changes. And um, when there aren't factories anymore and there aren't working people sitting together for eight hours a day, five days a week, they're gonna have to find a new way to organize. So I think that'll be the role for unions. And I think the young people doing all of these jobs and being misclassified um, are going to have to be the ones to step up and make sure that that happens. So, um, to the question of why, why are unions important to this generation, I think we're going to be the working people who have to uh, find a way to have a voice. Just before we come to the next question, any questions or comments? This one. I think the 1099 workers don't have access to health care either, right? Right, so yeah, we were talking about how unions protect benefits that you might have, like your health insurance, your 401k. Um, I don't know if people saw the Guardian article last week, but for Uber drivers, they MIT did a study and they make about $3.37 an hour. We have a former Uber driver on our staff, and he, the first time I met him, he had a CPA who did his taxes, and they had told him for 2014 he made $2.64 an hour. Um, and that was after he quit his job because he, he was working at the airport. Uber was like, yeah, you can make $35 an hour, buy a vehicle, become a driver. He did that and ended up making less than $3 an hour. So we call that super sub minimum wage, which is like less than 20% of what minimum wage is. So they're not even, not a, you know, normally like we represent at Teamsters, we say everyone from A to Z, so airline pilots to zookeepers like the Woodland Park Zoo, those zookeepers are Teamsters. And we have lots of Teamsters who make a lot of money and have really great benefits. But for the new way people are working, um, you're just trying to piece things together, meaning when we sit down and have a meeting, people are no longer like, I want a higher contribution to my, uh, you know, my pension, and they're just trying to make it to next week. They're just trying to make minimum wage. Um, and so that's a huge shift that I think is happening as an undercurrent and that people kind of recognize is going on. Like we all have the app and we know something's going on, uh, but I don't know if we're really seeing the broader impacts of the way that the economy is changing for working people. So that all the protections, all the things we fought for do not apply to people who are not an employee. Um, so I think we'll hear from more of the, the panelists about some of the awesome work that they've done. Um, we just, you know, I hope unions are thinking about how we can apply that to the future. Can I say something about that? Please. Yeah, okay. There's actually a couple of really good examples of labor um, going broader for that very reason that Don is talking about. So. Labor and community organizations and faith organizations really came together to um, move the uh, initiative 1488, the minimum wage and paid sick leave initiative a couple of years ago. And then last year in the legislature, same kind of allies, labor, community, faith, came together and were able to um, negotiate with business 
to get a paid family leave program for Washington State workers. And part of the reason we were able to get business to come to the table and actually work with us <coughs> on that is because we passed an initiative the year before, and they knew that we were going to pass a paid family leave initiative if they didn't come to some agreement for a piece of legislation. So they did. The four groups came together, and legislators too, uh, came up with this paid family leave. So starting in 2020, Washingtonians will um, be able to get, I believe it's 90% of your pay for 12 weeks uh, when you have um, a family or your own medical need. Like that includes having a child, it includes taking care of an older parent, those kinds of things. So I think in what, you know, in what Don's talking about and like not a clear way to come go to your employer and get those things, we can push the state to establish these kind of um, programs. And universal health care would be another one. So I think yeah, that's it's such a real team. issue. Yeah. So if a person wants to get his stuff to you, would you guys be able to start with? Yeah, I think I think you guys probably all have. I think each union has like a, you know, for us, we you can go on our website and see Teamster jobs that are available. You can come by your office and we have postings from employers. Um, and so you know, like if you become a, a forklift driver at one of our warehouses for Safeway, they start at like twenty four dollars an hour, and they have a main like they don't pay anything for their health care. They pay ten dollars for a visit, whether it's a surgery or just a checkup. Like they have amazing benefits and nobody thinks like, you know, I'm going to try to be a forklift driver in Auburn, um, but it's actually a great job that you can have with great benefits and your family's covered. So I don't know, how does it work at AFT and SAU? How do you guys let people know? Well, Barbie, you want a chance to respond? Yes. Well, I think um, there's Either you can get hired into a represent union, currently union represented position. So for us, it's mostly state um, employees um, at WFC. And those positions have already organized. The other way forward is to organize in your workplace, um, which is which is very challenging. And there's some like, but also very rewarding um, to form a new union. So um, when I was an AFT member, or when I became an AFT member, when I worked for the colleges, which was my previous job, uh, we had just organized it, a new union. And so we sort of built that process together. Um, so those are the two directions. And I do believe, um, I don't know the exact place where we post jobs, but I would be happy to look into that if anyone has questions, follow up on that. Cool. Do you want to take a, um, a stab at why um, unions are social justice why, there, why it is a social justice uh, sure. issue? Sure. Well, I think that we're all whole people. Um, we can't compartmentalize um, our work lives from our personal lives, from our communities, from our families. Um, and our experiences, you know, really, really are broad. And um, I, just, I like to think of unions as organizing whole people. And so we bring, like, our relationships, we bring the issues we face in our community, our commute. Um, our, you know, personal, personal challenges um, to work, and we bring our work home. So for me, um, looking at those broader experiences people have is really important for labor. Um, and unions have <coughs> made huge impacts in people's lives on a broad range of issues that intersect with racial justice, with gender justice, with health and safety, with the environmental movement. And I agree with, um, I think it was Karen who mentioned that, you know, unions haven't, have, you know, haven't always made the best choices. There's a history, like I think all organizations, where sometimes people start to look at narrow interests and sometimes people look at, reach out and look at broader interests. Um, and that unions have in the past and continue today to have to make those choices. What we see is that when we reach out, when we have what I would call authentic solidarity, when we, instead of sort of looking at our narrow interests, we look at the way that we can build power together as working people and stand up for people who have less power within our groups. Um, we tend to be stronger, and that's usually when unions have grown, when the labor movement has grown. 
Um, and I think right now, one of the biggest things we're facing is this issue of precarious workers and unstable or informal work, where more and more employers are trying to get away from the rights workers won in the past by changing their legal categories, <coughs> by changing um, you know, the ways that um, people basically making them part-time, things like that. So you have fewer rights. Um, and I was just really inspired by the recent West Virginia teachers strike. Um, they went on strike outside of the legal right to strike or the legal right to bargain um, under existing labor law. Um, and they were, didn't just get a raise for themselves. And I think that's really powerful and I think it speaks to you know looking um, at the way we sort of orient our work. Um, they actually got a 5% raise for public workers across the state. And I think that is that is a great example of solidarity and it's a great example of um, how our movements, you know, we should be fighting for transportation, we should be fighting for racial justice, we should be fighting for any issues that our members experience and our communities experience um, so that we continue to lift each other up as we make as we as we make a difference. Tell me, do you want to respond to why unions are social justice issue? Why a union is a social justice issue? Um. So we got the social justice issue when we talk about something that anything anti-union. Kind of. And, mm -hmm. and we really mm -hmm. come together on that with other people. Mm -hmm. and so we could actually take down that myth you were mentioning before. Um, so we really hurt the union. But it's still, so the union is still actually fighting, encouraging, and really mobilizing people. And we want other people to be involved in that. And, and whether, whether it's what, believe it or not, they're encouraging people to join, and that's important. But we have to be willing to fight for, for our rights and for, for other people and their diversity. And I think, I don't know if you have more to say, you can say, I'm going to move on to another question, okay. unless you have more to say, um, add. I, I mean, just like, I just wanted to add something. Sure. Um, so the work that I do, um, so I'm an organizer with SCIU Healthcare, um, and specifically the work that I do is organizing non-organized workers, right, non-union workers, right, um, and so I specifically go in and talk to people in hospitals, right, in healthcare. And we recently organized um, about 850 workers in Tri-Cities at Catholic. Um, and I've worked with people of all different backgrounds, right, different ages, races, um, you name it, right? And so the fact that folks were going through things like racism, right, like um, discrimination from, you know, for their religion in the workplace, right? Um, and then being able to talk about these issues. And some of these people have had it, like experience with unions before, but some have it. Right, and so a lot of people have had to put up with these things, right? Even having to work a second job, right? These these are healthcare workers, right? Like, this is like they have another job, and there's people who are working beyond 40 hours a week nowadays, right? Even in hospitals, and so you know things like racism and economic justice—it's not isolated, right? It happens everywhere, even healthcare, right? Where you receive care, you know, one way, you know, everybody receives healthcare, right? Or, or we'd like to think, right, needs healthcare, right? And comes in and out of these hospital doors, and so making sure that, you know these places are welcoming for not only our communities, but also for the healthcare workers who are part of those communities that are working there, right? Who are being, um, you know, discriminated against by their managers sometimes, right? Or aren't being paid fair wages or aren't able to take their breaks, right? That's a safety issue. Um, and so, you know, it definitely is a social justice issue, right? So it's happening everywhere. And, um, you know, the workers that I work with are, um, you know, very, um, how do I say this? really, um, powerful, right? I think it's like they've always been empowered, right? It's not this thing of like me going in there and empowering them as an organizer. It's just them realizing that strength that they already have. 
Um, and so the fact that they're able to do that, stand up in the workplace and have a voice, and push back on these issues, right, social justice issues, not only, like now I'm starting to see those workers that, you know, back in April first organized and were really scared, right, and seeing them now starting to talk to city council members, right, about why they're organizing and fighting for a strong first contract, right, for themselves and for their patients. Um, so that, yeah, this is definitely um, a social justice issue, right, we're covering different um, issues here. I'm a, I'm a GSPEC member of the uh, AFT for the General Council of the Community. And, um, I have a couple of questions about social justice and racial justice issues. So, um, you know, I, I have followed your work, you know, about uh, the unionization of order and I think it's really inspiring. It's like, you know, a really new kind of organizing which was missing in the time. And you, I think you really, really put it well together with the time of the 2009 to you know, the session. Um, Similar thing which we're seeing now in terms of work precarity is for undocumented workers, especially with ice rates and everything happening. So I have a few questions on that. Does you know the both C or AFT pro staff or AFT you know faculty do they have policies about you know standing up against those things you know or like you know just having a <coughs> voice you know not just in the workplace but like you know in the bigger context of you know the, the state you know senate and you know. Um, City Council, you know, like standing up for people there. And secondly, you know, like we saw in the last elections, you know, um, that union, you know, members, you know, voted for Trump because that's what, you know, was the dictate coming from, you know, union leadership, you know, for most part of the country. Um, so in that regard, does, you know, any of our unions, you know, do they have, have they endorsed political candidates, you know, if not, why? Or like, you know, what, you know, what are the candidates, you know, which have been just because I feel like all that adds up to the racial justice and social justice conference. I can't speak to the first bit. I'm going to let Karen, because she's from the AFT. Oh, so yeah, I mean, on the question about taking a position and, and acting on behalf of social justice issues, we do that at the state level in a number of ways. One is passing resolutions. So we have a couple of different resolutions related to um, immigrant rights. And so, for example, um, working with our members on in their workplace, in this case, college campuses, uh, you know, so for specific things like you know, ensuring that there are support networks within the um, within the colleges, providing materials to our members so that they're versed in what their rights are and how they can help immigrant students and or colleagues, things like that. So we pass resolutions, and that helps to direct action. And it often will direct action at a legislative, either state legislative or federal legislative level. So that's one of the most common ways that we formalize our positions on social justice issues. Uh, other times, though, it's just so congruent with our value set that we take action uh, less formally, but sort of more consistently. Your second part of your question, you asked about political engagement. I know that all the unions <coughs> represented here, as well as Teamsters, have a really robust political program where we are actively endorsing candidates and that goes from you know the city the mayor for the city of black diamond to like we're doing something called judge fest coming up which is like 38 people are run there's 38 judgeships that are up for election and judges can't go out and campaign in the same way as normal politicians can and it's not something that we always talk about like we think about who's going to be in the senate or who's in the congress but the people who decides what law can be upheld and which law gets dismissed and not just who's going to jail but like policies that affect entire communities like are we going to are we going to throw people in jail for not having money are we going to start making it a crime to be poor um, and those things are all decisions that happen like at the judicial level and and people don't know what it takes to be a judge but really you can just get appointed a lot of times like you apply for a job you get the job and then you can be appointed to a judgeship and then and all of a sudden you're the decider um, and so that's just one example of like we're trying to engage young people in our union in the political process by making sure that they get to be face to face with people who say they want to be um, the mayor or a city council member or a judge. Um, but you know we have to. There are a lot of places where we we miss the mark. I think like you said, there were unions who endorsed Donald Trump. Um, you know, a couple of years ago here in Seattle, our union was trying to lead the charge to stop the um, Arctic drilling and so to stop the the oil rig that was moving out of T5T, you remember that? People got arrested for being in kayaks. We like we were leading the charge in this and we wrote this letter and then we heard from our international union in DC who said, hey, there could be Teamster Union jobs on an oil pipeline, so back off. Um, and so, you know, there's there are these tensions that exist, um, but I think people talked about earlier on the panel 
making uh, alliances with the community to try to make actual change. And so being involved in the political process, <coughs> being invested in endorsements, and trying to have alliances to move political change. I think helps you guys want to talk more about your political project. I'll say something quickly is just that, you know, our members ultimately make decisions around this. So involvement is really important because if you're engaged and, and participating in that process, you can um, make a difference in what what endorsements are made. And um, I will also say, I know that Tommy has been doing work um, and many of our other members um, on some of our existing legislation campaigns right now. And so showing up and talking to legislators, and I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but. When members are out there um, as, as voters and as workers coming together and, and really speaking to the issues, it's powerful and sometimes it can help um, sway politicians who really may be hearing a lot from you know, business interests, corporate interests, and to have working people there um, together can make a big difference. I hate to hog too much air time, but I also wanted to um, add on uh, to what um, both Don and Dar Darby are saying, Labor also has an increasingly robust candidate uh, training program. So looking to bring up um, members, union members, to run for office. And maybe the most uh, infamous one you all might be aware of is Teresa Mosqueda on the Seattle City Council now. Comes right out of Labor. She worked at the State Labor Council. And we call it, it's a path to power program. But it's for that very reason, too, is that really making sure that working people's interests are advocating but also in the decision in the seat that gets to vote so another piece of that pie i think if i hadn't ever been in a union like i'm on the board for one america votes one america is the biggest immigrant rights organization in washington and with that you know they passed the washington voter rights act they were they the dream act for washington um and i was actually on that board with Teresa. like she she got off that board so she could go and be a city council person i wouldn't have ended up um, having that level of interaction with boards like One America, or organizations like One America, if our union wasn't out making partnerships in the community, you wouldn't necessarily see a connection between the two, but there's lots of partnerships like that exist and lots of opportunities for young people who want to get involved um, in politics or have influence um, where you otherwise wouldn't. Does anyone on the panel want to explain the U.S. Supreme Court case yeah, this case and how that may impact news. I don't know if people are familiar with it or not. I think everyone's familiar. One of you guys. So can you repeat that? I couldn't hear you at all. Would you mind repeating that question? I wonder if someone on the panel, uh, for the benefit of those who don't in the room who don't know, it would be an informal poll, know about the U.S. Supreme Court case, and if they know, that's fine. But then how it may impact labor and unions. Um. Do you want to go? Oh, Tommy Monaghan. Go ahead, you go. You go first. I'll look up the alpha, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> to be a member 
doesn't pay into the representation that they receive um, by their union. That's basically it. So it's a mat it's a financial matter. What it does though is it impacts our power. So imagine going to bargain a new contract for wages and job security and treatment at work um, and benefits, uh, work hours, whatever whatever the topics you're going to negotiate with the boss. Imagine trying to go into that negotiation with 30% membership or even 50% membership as opposed to 80 or 90% membership. It's not the same. Um, members also vote. Members vote on who the leaders are, what our policies are going to be, what political platforms we take, um, and ultimately are able to also participate in leadership development, things like path to power. And so um, this court case is being viewed as an attack on public sector workers specifically, um, but it's also an attack on the public services that we provide. Because union, right now, public sector unions actually have a 35% density, so 35% membership across the country, approximately. And we still have the ability to fight for public jobs, to fight against the privatization of services. Um, I think that the case will, you know, based on how right to work has lowered wages and working conditions for working people in other states, that it has the potential to severely hurt unions across the country, public sector unions, and our communities. But we also do still have a choice. Um, so despite this ruling, if members choose to continue to pay and to stay involved and to support their organizations and be members, um, unions can still be strong, even under this condition. Mm -hmm. Which I think is where my hope lies. Mm -hmm. so I can so again, we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to decide yet. Um, but it, it can, it's going to get to the federal level, so it can impact all of us, all of the whole country. That's where we're at. Yeah, and um, I think in addition to all of that, um, all our unions right are getting ready, right, for that decision. We're all preparing in one way or another. Um, speaking for SCIU 1199, we actually are running a, have been running a program um, called Voices United for Power. Where we're actually having conversations with all 29, over 29,000 members in the state of Washington, right, about the power of um, you know unions and collective you know organizing and what it means for them to have a union and what what this year, what Janice means, right, what that's going to mean for them. Um, so. Organizers and leaders of our union, right, our members are having conversations with their coworkers, and this has been going on for months and months, right? Um, because it is a financial attack, right? The, it's weakening our unions. We're explaining and we're talking about what it means to be a, a voluntary dues-paying member, right? Especially for public sector um, facilities that we represent that are going to impact, right? First, um, so those are the things that you know. For example, our union is doing to prepare for the decision um, this summer, and you know, hoping that we're able to still. Um, push forward with our collective strength, um, but it's definitely going to for sure take a hit, right, our unions, and I think um, the really inspiring thing, though, is just to see our union members um, taking ownership, right, this is their union, um, stepping up and rising to the occasion, right, um, they're taking this really seriously and making sure that all, um, all of the members, right, are being talked to, so. It really is kind of a mindset. Changing, you know how we feel about our jobs and our workplace, and why it's worth doing it. Paying for what it's worth, you know, you pay for the fee, but it really is more you know, that for the protections that you're working. Thank you for the opportunity. I know people have to move out to their next class or next option, but um, thanks for the opportunity to address you all. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their time. So if you need to go, you're welcome to. I'm not sure if any of our panels have any additional time, but if you had questions that you didn't get to ask and you want to ask them, please ask them first if they have time. And if yes, then go ahead and ask that question. I want to thank you for joining us for this series, and I hope to see you again next quarter. I'll take your surveys as you're walking out. If you didn't get one and you want one, come talk to me. Thank you. Thank you.